you were about to tell me about how long uh, Lean has been around. You look at all the writing and, uh, you know, people go back to Ono and we are still talking about the Toyotas and uh, the Onos and the Shingos. This is 1900s and uh, people are translating the books they wrote, their, uh, you know, uh, protégés wrote. I've always felt that uh, we're in 2022 and uh, <laughs> yeah. there is not a single original thought. I mean, we talk about things like kata and standardized work, but, you know, standardized work for an industrial engineer like me is work study. There are books about it. Okay, they gave us the Toyota production system. Fine. You know, I mean, the lean guys gave us the Toyota production system, but look at those guys, Shook, Womack, Jones, Kraftchik. Zero industrial engineering. Zero industrial engineering. This is exactly why I had to have you come on the show. <laughs> Shari, as you have such a strong opinion on this. And I think I think it's worth backing up for just a second and, and giving us what is the definition of an industrial engineer so that people listening, they might not know one. I, I know a few. I know a handful of industrial engineers and all of you strike me very similarly. So I appreciate <laughs> you coming out. Guns <laughs> Can I, can I just read the definition of industrial yes, engineer? Yeah. So <laughs> this is... And people, ladies and gentlemen, as a good engineer, Sharuk is prepared with the definition to read. So he gets he gives you exactly the right definition. No telephone game is going to happen here. <laughs> so this comes off the website of the Institute of Industrial and Systems Engineers. Industrial and Systems Engineering is concerned with the design, improvement, and installation of integrated systems of people, materials, information, equipment, and energy. It draws upon specialized knowledge and skill in the mathematical, physical, and social sciences, together with the principles and methods of engineering analysis and design to specify, predict, and evaluate the results to be obtained from such systems. Oh, that's beautiful. It reminds me of uh, the line of thinking and the philosophy that I've picked up from reading uh, anything by William Edwards Deming and his system of profound knowledge. And of course, for people that don't know, Deming was originally trained as a physicist and a scientist and approached everything very scientifically. The definition just resonates with the type of thinking that he had. So I think there's something to that type of thinking. And it definitely has flavors of, like you mentioned, like these different books or experiences people had with lean and what they come out with, like they're their sliver of experience in a certain domain or area. And we rarely get the whole thing. I do want to just mention to everybody that Taichi Ono was by training an industrial engineer. Hey. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's, you know, so, so take that, you know, for all, for all the people thinking that uh, you might be triggered during this episode, you're probably right. So, <laughs> And Shigeo Shingo too. <laughs> Shigeo, absolutely. Shigeo Shingo. Welcome to the EBFC show, the easier, better for construction podcast. I'm your host, Felipe Engineer Manriquez. This show is all about the business of construction. Today's episode is sponsored by Bosch Refine My Site is a cloud-based construction collaboration platform that applies lean principles to enable your entire team to plan, communicate, and execute in real time. It's the digital tool that works in tandem with your last planner system process and puts it all together in one simple collaborative ecosystem system. This easy to use platform is available in English, German, Spanish, Portuguese, and French and can be used on desktops, tablets, and mobile devices. According to Spencer Easton, scheduling manager at Oakland Construction, Refine My Site, in my opinion, is the best, leanest tool on the market for the last planet. Here's what our users have to say. We've looked at three other digital scheduling platforms and none compare to the straightforward approach Refine My Site takes. From milestone planning all the way down to daily tasks, this program gives every general contractor and their trade partners meaningful collaboration, accountability, and KPIs. Register today to try Refine My Site for free for 60 days. Today's show is also sponsored by the Lean Construction Institute. LCI is working to lead the building industry in transforming its practices and culture. Its vision 
is to create a healthy and thriving industry that delivers outstanding project outcomes every time for everyone. Check the show notes for more information. Now, to the show. Welcome to the show, Dr. Sharuk Irani. Dr. Sharuk Irani. I'm just going to call you Sharuk from this point forward because you've already given me permission to even before we got started. So I appreciate that, Sharuk. Sharuk, we met on a LinkedIn message thread of all places after uh, getting uh, stirred around on some question of, you know, last planner, critical path method scheduling. And I even wrote a blog post about it and it's published this week. I'll put a link in the show notes for people to check that out. And what we found in that back and forth is that uh, some of these topics that people hold near and dear to the heart are having an extremely high emotional charge. And uh, the way that you were um, communicating back and forth in this thread, I said, here's somebody that definitely knows something, absolutely has great experiences, and you were engaging people with curiosity. And I would even go so far as to say, humble inquiry is how you were engaging. And uh, a lot of people got scared off by, uh, I'm just going to say, like, they just got scared by some of the questions that you and Prasad were asking in the thread and a couple other people as well. And people didn't want to answer. And instead of answering with either, I don't know, or I might be wrong, they, some people left the thread. They just walked away. (laughs) Many others stayed behind, but uh, that, uh, that humble inquiry that you had and that genuine curiosity to learn more is what got me hooked. And then I, I started following you on LinkedIn and I was seeing some of the posts that you had. And I realized, man, this guy is uh, an author. He's actually written a book called uh, Job Shop Lean. And I said, this, this is something that needs to be explored more because of the types of experiences and background you have. So I am very humbled to have you on the Thank podcast. You. I'm currently a consultant, but I also am an adjunct uh, faculty in the Department of Industrial Engineering at the University of Houston. Um, I began as a typical academic. Uh, I was in India. Uh, anyway, in, in India, they, you know, you have to get educated, you know. You know, you have to go to America, right? So that was it. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard that before, but <laughs> <laughs> this is the land of opportunity. Whatever, whatever. I'm going to tell Doctor M that. I'm going to tell. <laughs> I'm going to tell Doctor M. Uh, Cornet to Sharuk, you haven't uh, arrived yet because you haven't come to America to study. <laughs> He's going to love that. <laughs> so um, I did my bachelor's uh, in mechanical engineering, but it was in production engineering. And back then, I learned something about something called group technology and manufacturing cells and how people work in teams. And the assembly line is uh, demeaning, working in teams, work cells. So it, it hooked me. It hooked me. And uh, then I learned about industrial engineering, and there was this engineering profession that using mathematical models to design machine shops and inventory planning. And I was like, whoa, uh, there seems to be something fun in industrial engineering. So I hated mechanical engineering, but <laughs> I loved production engineering. I loved industrial engineering. So came to the US, right? So bachelor's, two years master's in industrial engineering, four years PhD in industrial engineering at Penn State. Boom, I began my academic career, uh, 1990, University of Minnesota. Uh, Then six years later, I got this better job at Ohio State and I continued for 16 years there. Guess what, if you'll notice, I did not work in industry as an industrial engineer. And I didn't know how bad it was. I did not know how bad it was, you know, because in an academia, you publish papers, you you please a couple, you know, your peers, and everybody says you're wonderful. Uh, there is no expectation that your research should actually change something in industry. You know, that's academia. That's how screwed up, you know, that's how screwed up academia is. Um, and ladies and gentlemen, that's from his mouth. That's not from my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I just... <laughs> <laughs> I did get to participate in some research with the Construction Industry Institute, and they pair us with uh, academics, and they're not shy about what you're describing. is not uh, atypical. You write papers. It sometimes seems like the more you write to get cited and the more citations you get, the more traction you go with your paper, 
that is a measure of success. That's like the metric that they use citations and being referenced in other papers and you're writing papers for other people writing papers. Bingo. Yeah. Bingo. I mean, the research is some, sometimes there is groundbreaking research that definitely changes how we can work and how we think, but the papers are written from the perspective of somebody in academia that may or may not have industry experience and may or may not want to actually be changing anything. They just they want to study something that's interesting to them. And uh, sometimes we get the beneficial side effects of, of learning things that we do apply in, uh, I mean, I've benefit. I've personally benefited from research, hundred sure. percent. Our paper is written that, but uh, as a consumer of the research, it's not something that you're like, I can't wait for this next. It's not like you're you're going to binge research papers like you would like a Netflix episode or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Yeah, yeah, like oh, look at the <laughs> equations. All oh, these statistics are just off the chain. <laughs> It's just so many citations. <laughs> These footnotes are incredible. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> so you realized that, uh, like you said in the beginning, you're you were just an imaginary engineer, an, IE, an IE for real. <laughs> yes, yes, and and you know, 1999. Uh, so I had a colleague, uh, Professor Blaine Lilly, and I give him credit personally, you know, uh, he was teaching, he was like a joint faculty between mechanical engineering and industrial engineering. And uh, he was teaching a course on lean manufacturing. And uh, they were re- using that book, Lean Thinking by Womack and Jones. I had read the machine that changed the world prior, previously. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, you finished reading that book so uh, just to give you some contrast i finished reading the the machine that changed the world and i was like why didn't i read this 10 years ago and i was just like so many things i had no idea and uh, <laughs> i'll tell you what i'll tell you what did this to me i'll tell you what happened then so he said you haven't read this book been thinking said, no you should okay Blake, if you say so i will so i read the book and, you know, they had that thing about value stream mapping. And I'm like, this is a process map. Duh. Oh. oh you know? Uh, oh. Uh, then they talked about waste. And I'm like, huh. I taught the flow process chart, but I never viewed it, those symbols as detecting waste. And here they're giving me seven wastes. And these wastes map onto those symbols. Duh. You know? I started making connections. Now, what happened was in that same year, 1999, you know, we academics, we have to get funding yeah. to fund our students, right? So I went down to the Delphi plant on Broad Street. And as usual, I was sucking up and uh, met the plant manager. So she lets me into her office and said, Dr. Rani, I'm really sorry. Uh, I have to go do a Kaizen on value stream mapping with the team. Like, what? Kaizen? What's value stream mapping? So she brings up the book, Learning to See. You, know, you haven't read oh, this book? I've read that book too. So far, all the books you've mentioned, I've read. So I'm so excited. We have all these books in common. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, um, so, you know, I had never heard of Kaizen. And I said, what's Kaizen? Oh, it's, it's, a, it's a quick improvement event. And I was like, oh, all we do is the capstone project. All we do is non-thesis projects. This was like, boom, boom, boom. You know, you have an issue, bring people together. They are given charge. I said, no industrial engineers? No, 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 they do it themselves. So, you know, it was like, wow, wow. And that's when it slowly sank in that, yes, I'm an imaginary engineer. I had no hands-on experience doing my stuff. And Lean was showing me how industrial engineering gets implemented. (laughs) That's incredible. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I've got some friends that uh, came out of Delphi and they've had, uh, they actually had brought in at different points in time, some lean senseis from Toyota and they did some like apprentice type learning and training. And the funny thing is what happens is they, as they worked through Delphi and they retired, they became like retired Toyota people and started partnering with the lean enterprise Institute and doing like workshops and teaching people about lean and value stream mapping is definitely one of them. We're even seeing that start to uh, come across in a, in a heavier way 
even in agile methods such as Scrum, where <clears throat> value stream mapping has been a part of Scrum Master training for as long as I've known. And it's something that I put all my students through as well, that when I'm teaching them Scrum, and it's just so refreshing to hear that it's being used and it was being used in the in the 90s and when and you approached it and you've seen it in industrial engineering just under a different name yes so it's like we're on we're on to something good here if we're using it in different industries even with a little bit of different flavoring no i i fully agree with you that you know of course i'll you know piss off people again so this is a four letter word but you know instead of giving people belts in six sigma or lean i would say you know, first year industrial engineering degree certification. I mean, I would certify everybody in industrial engineering. Why? Because industrial engineering is a profession. It has longevity. You know, these buzzwords, JIT, world-class manufacturing, they all come and go. They'll all keep churning over and over again, you know. Uh, we need to put this stuff into what we educate the future engineers or managers with. It has to be systematized, institutionalized, you know, with all these buzzwords. Like, People have said integrated TOC Lean Six Sigma. Now what? They'll put OPEX somewhere? I mean, like, you know, of course you need capacity planning, you need layout and flow, you need ergonomics, you need quality control. So what you'll keep coming up with more buzzwords and soon you'll have an integrated something that runs across the full page. You know, we, I think if American industry has to get serious about, you know, now that they're onshoring and nearshoring, Get your act together, get something serious going. I mean, let industry really do industrial engineering, you know, really, you know. Yeah, really, don't hold back. And I, as you reminded me, as you were <laughs> telling me about the belts that uh, I watched a webinar uh, this week, actually, where Nigel Thurlow, who wrote uh, the Principal Flow Guides, co-author, he had worked at Toyota as well, and also worked uh, at, with Scrum extensively and brought Scrum into Toyota. Uh, sometime, I think along the same time period that we're talking about your background here. And he said of belts, because he was asked by the audience of like, what kind of belt should we get? And he's like, just so you all know, the only belts I ever saw at Toyota were conveyor belts. <laughs> not the belts they wore around their waist. <laughs> not, even, not even those. He said, <laughs> just conveyor belts. They're elastic. <laughs> Probably know how to get their pants size right. So you <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I want you to, you know, step us through what uh, Job Shop Lean is. You did a great job of giving us your foundation, your background, and and now you're you're at the Delphi plant. I bet you could tell stories from your experiences there. But I want to get into Job Shop Lean because you know you've wrote, you, you've criticized people writing books and papers, and here you've written a book, which I just I love. I love that you've done that. I've also written a book. And so I, I appreciate, uh, you know, what it takes to do such, you know, carry that out. That's an event in of itself. And so tell us about uh, what Job Shop Lean is and, and how you came to write that book. Like what compelled you to put down writing papers for academia for just a little bit and write a book for people maybe trying to implement some of these industrial engineering practices? You know, again, it's uh, in academia, it's all about money. Okay. You, wherever somebody throws money, you jump, you know, I know there's another profession where also you do the same thing, but we won't go there. I'm not a good dancer. <laughs> won't go there, won't go there. So in uh, 2003, uh, John Durpak, who was uh, heading up, he was a director at the Advanced Technology Institute. Uh, he came and met Professor Rajiv Shivpuri, a very good friend of mine. And Professor Shivpuri was like forging casting, he was into those, you know, net shape forming processes. So I think Mr. Durpak asked Rajiv, hey, do you have any other faculty who, you know, might be interested in working on this, you know, research grant? So the grant was basically how to reduce the lead time on forgings that are supplied to defense primes. They had issues with the quality and the lead time of forgings, custom forge shops. So Mr. Turbeck comes into my office and he goes, what do you do? So I said, you know, I do this thing on group technology, cellular manufacturing, and I've just started into lean. But I'm, I'm working with, uh, everybody's doing assembly. I said, you know, MIT is doing this, uh, Michigan's doing, everybody's into Toyota. They've already beaten me to it. 
I'm going to go into the exact spectrum opposite. If assembly is one end of the spectrum, I'll go to the other end of the spectrum, which is job shops. So he said, uh, can you do it? I said, yeah. He said, you, you know that you know custom forge shops are very hard job shops. They have monuments, they have batch processing, and defense industry, very fickle about lot sizing. And do I said, I'll do it. <laughs> what did I know that it would be hard? <laughs> yes. I'll do it. <laughs> if they could do it in the assembly, I can do it anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so you do that for money, right? You do that for money. So um, that was it basically. He said, you give me lean for job shops and I'll fund you. So he funded me in 2004 through 2012. I am going to create Lean for Job Shops. And I had started an online chat group on Yahoo called JS Lean because I wanted to separate Lean from what I was doing. I was saying, my thing is Job Shop Lean. It's not Lean. Oh, my God. I mean, there were people throwing any crap that they could throw at me because it was like, how dare you challenge Lean? <laughs> I said, I've got the proof. I said, you want a value stream map of a thousand forgings by hand? And you want to have a discussion about improvements by drawing one forging routing on a value stream map? What about the other 999? I, I'm good for a fight. <laughs> you know, if you want yes, an confirm. argument. I confirm this. He is good for a fight. So anyway, so the, so you know what again hit me in the face was Turpak said, look, if your research doesn't get implemented every year at at least one forge shop, no funding for you next year. There you go. And for an academic, that's like the kiss of death. Huh? What did you say? I, I got to implement my research. So you know, <laughs> I learned. I, I realized that I had to win my customers, the forging industry, by saying, sir, I'll make it work. So, you know, workshops, internships, the software tool, you know, everything I did it, I because I'm, I was not going to give up. I'm like, I'm going to show you that it works. And I succeeded. 2012 to 2014, I was lucky. I Herbiger Corporation, Hannes Hanschowski, the president, said, you come to us and you implement your job shop lead. I like what you're doing. Imagine, right? This was the first, first industry job I had. And you know what? All I did was I went with my heart and what was right. And by golly, I did it. I pissed off some of the executives along the way. But, you know, I mean, you know, look, when you, when you value ergonomics and safety and administration thinks you're trying to unionize the workforce, there's a problem with what you're doing. Yes. That's a very big disconnect. Yeah, I was, I was, I was literally told by the HR director. He came down from Florida and he said, "So I heard that uh, you are trying to unionize our people." I said, "No, I'm giving training. I'm asking people what I can do to help them." The lathe operator walks up to me and says, "Dr. Rani, my jeep crane not working. I'm standing on the Vietnamese, right? I'm standing on the lathe." and holding the part as it gets parted from the bushy, oily races. You, that's safe? The guy steps up on the lace to hold the part? No. Oh, I'm warning you. I've seen many people come and go, like you. Guess what will happen to you? Okay, I mean, I'm not going to... So, that's a threat. So I, I love that someone in HR just dropped in a threat. <laughs> absolutely. It's not, absolutely. Anyone who's worked in uh, continuous improvement, if you've ever tried to create a, a significant type of change, you will get people coming out of the woodwork with fancy titles, threatening you in these nondescript type of ways. This is so common, uh, this story that you're sharing. And, and I love too that uh, this, this story is happening in Texas. I'm just on that story alone with the lathe operator coming to you. People are not resistant to making improvements. So people let the stereotypes go stop proliferating the stereotypes that human beings don't want their conditions to get better. Oh, no. And, and the whole concept, like my background, my parents were both in the unions, uh, even though I was trained as electrical engineer. Okay. And I did take one because we had only to take one industrial engineering course. And 
I'll come back to that later because <laughs> thank you. We can so, bond, man. We can yeah. bond, buddy. We, we will bond. We will cross. <laughs> we will cross train bond with each other for sure. When you got confronted by HR and they're basically telling you to stop or stop organizing the people, stop teaching the people skills, because we want to keep this chaos, this chaos that we have where people don't know how to generate value or see the value in what they do, and it doesn't it doesn't necessarily translate. They want people to just have a job where they're possibly, I'm just putting, putting this out there because I've seen this and experienced this where in order to have control, people perceive that they need to create uh, barriers to knowledge so that they can have and maintain control. And that's a very negative thing for so many different reasons. And our philosophy, I think is aligned. I've got the respect for people right here on the chest. And I think a lot of people have even expanded that and said, it's, it's more seated a respect for humanity. And when you operate from that principle and you've, you are operating from a principle of I've got to survive and I'm going to actually benefit and help these people. Your interest in creating job shop lean was to see that these types of industrial engineering practices can be applied in non typical assembly or Toyota production system ways. So I think that's, you're already jumping outside of what's typical, normal and expected. And you got, you got flack in the yeah. Yahoo group. I mean, just just in the you try to create a community to talk about it, and people are like, ah, coming at, attacking you for being like a heretic, like as if it's a cult of lean. And I agree. Uh, it is a cult of lean people. <laughs> it's yeah. stuff, stuff yeah. <laughs> and then you get uh, you get invited by an executive into the Milby Street facility. And you're facing resistance, not from the frontline workers, not from people at the job shop, but from people outside that are perceiving power losses because you're working with people and introducing changes and you have to understand how people think and react in their environment. So it's critical. So I just love that. Be sure that please uh, take me back to that story. So you're, you're facing the, you know, the Cobras of HR. <laughs> <laughs> You're surviving that. What do you do next? Uh, whatever I did not know, like like you would have seen, right? The imaginary engineer thing, right? I was in yeah. purely in academia. And even when I began working with industry starting 1999, it was still like a hands-off, right? The students right. were there full-time. The you know industry partners were there, right? Here, I was in charge. So I began and I put my finger Again, we, forget me, everything from the receiving warehouse right down to shipping. We had like two focus factories, the machine shop, which did the metal parts, and then the polymer uh, bushings, which were like the sealant thing, right? So there was uh, there were two parts to the business and everything. Uh, I put my finger on everything. And the focus was basically with job shop lean is, you try to create work cells. So with work cells, what you're doing is you're taking a value stream, a family of parts, and you're putting it physically to the extent you can in one area, one team, one goal, one physical location. So now if management has to do a gimbal walk, they go to the cell right. and they look at the metrics of delivery. They don't go and say, oh, you are not producing so many parts per hour and you have a scrap rate, right? If I get an order, I drop it into the cell. They give me a due date quote. I go back to the customer, end of discussion. We implemented cells to the extent we can uh, in the molding area with all the furnaces being monuments. Uh, Leonel Salinas was the supervisor of the molding department. He was damn good. You know, he, he knew his stuff, right? And so I didn't want to muck with that. It was more like, hey, Leo, what about this? Hey, Leo, what about that? In the machine shop, uh, they will work with you once they trust you. They will work with you. Most people do. Oh, you know, and, and there was a wonderful case, uh, Long Dam. He ran three milling machines which cut grooves on rings. Then as I was doing my gamba work one day, he called me and says, come see. Over the weekend, the man spruced up his area like nobody's business. He got it and he did it himself. And, you know, I feel that if you can reach that state with the lean implementation, I think then you become whatever title you have, director, sensei, blah, 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 whatever name you want to give yourself. But, yeah. it, you know, it, it's that, that somebody gets it and somebody says, you know what, I'll be successful if I make that guy successful. Let's do something, you know? 
that's important. Uh, but you should not forget that, you know, like today, everybody says, oh, we have a very active Kaiser program. Yeah, but where's the focus? Are you creating a work cell? Are you are you are the Kaizens coming out from a value stream boundary? No. Then that's like the Tower of Babel thing. Go do whatever the hell you want. And you know, I mean, you know. So I think Kaizen is back a mole improvement. And <laughs> <laughs> going back to the book thing. So I became a consultant. I began, uh, I became a professor, adjunct faculty at the University of Houston. I began teaching these two classes. Uh, fundamentals of lean and then fundamentals of job shop lean. So I didn't have a textbook for job shop lean. So wrote the book and it's all it's all work I've done. So it's it's not like I bring you the Bible, you know, it's ongoing. But you know, job shop lean is not lean. That's what I keep asking people that you just know one thing, the Toyota model, and everything is built around what Toyota does. Even if they pass gas, you'll find out that they bent over and they you know, it's the really gets, you know, <laughs> at the end of the day, safety, quality, delivery, cost, inventory. Boom. But how you get there cannot be a cookie cutter approach. So, like chapter two in my book, that's basically I put a table. This is what the principle of lean is. This is how you do it in a job shop. These lean tools pss, replace them. And these are the replacements, you know. You and I have studied, and you definitely have now become a practitioner. You've implemented it. So you're no longer just a pure theoretician. Kind so, of. Well, welcome to industry. <laughs> if no one's welcomed you, <laughs> welcome you. Yeah, it's the same. I've had the same experience where I read something and then I want to take it from theory to go test it in the, in the wild with real human beings and see, does, do these concepts work? And some things don't work. And some things do. I only keep the things that do work and I let go of the things that don't. Let's break down two things first. So value stream mapping, you've said in industrial engineering has a corollary. Like, you know, when when I was at Ohio State, I loved uh, going and presenting industrial engineering during those recruitment meetings, you know, where parents would come with their children and, you know, the College of Engineering would say, uh, industrial engineering, please send your representative, you know, uh, and we would get what? maybe 15, 20 minutes to do our dog and pony show. Oh, nice. So guess what I would do? I would take the two value stream maps in the book, Learning to See, project them and say, this is time in motion study. This is facility layout. This is material handling. This is supply chain management. That is MRP. That's demand forecasting. That's distribution requirements planning. I would basically, that's shop floor control, that's operation scale. I would basically say, do you see this map, which is a mic, which a compact representation of any manufacturing business, yeah. shows all the courses that your child will study or has a may or may not study depending on their interest. But this is how you get anything that you buy a sh- pair of shoes, you know, toothpaste, a dishwasher. Yeah. This is a production system, and these are all the individual industrial engineering skills, functions that put together, that harnessed, get you your product. You would have had me change my major. <laughs> <laughs> my only industrial engineering course ha- had a special book, and the book was bound exactly like learning to see. <laughs> so it's just like, uh, as it was the only time. So that's why I remember it left such an impression on me. is because we had all these typical hardbound books and occasionally you get some soft covers in the humanities, but all the technical courses are always hardbound. And then this industrial engineering course had this like spiral bound workbook like thing. And with areas for you to like write in, like yeah. it was encouraging you to like make notes and, you know, be out there like in the world and uh, get this thing dirty, which I really appreciate. And industrial engineering, that course that I took was all about, uh, costing. It was like the business side first time in my electrical engineering training that we had some like business type of conversation and intentionally trying to figure out what do things cost. You've mentioned monuments and it makes perfect sense to me. So for people that are listening, the builders here, we're not talking about like an actual monument, but I think when uh, Sharuk says monument, we're talking about something in an area, in a manufacturing environment that cannot move. For all practical purposes, it will not move because of 
of how it's there and how it's connected. So I think the furnace was a great idea. Like a fur, anyone who's a builder knows like all the types of things that you have to do to create an environment where you would set up a boiler or a furnace or think having a central utility plant. And in manufacturing, sometimes uh, people that are there today had no influence on those things being set and how the plant has grown or changed over time. And now potentially, or it maybe never worked. It's in a bad spot these monuments. And so where would I see high mix, low volume systems in the real world, like in Texas? Go to any machine shop, go to any forge shop, go to a fabrication shop, uh, go to a steel service center, uh, mass customization, collision repair, semiconductor fabs, repair and refurbishing. All right. Those are all great examples. So that's, that's the high mix. We have lots of different types of parts, lots of high, high customization. Yes. Like I think the collision shop is a perfect example. No two crashes are exactly the same. Yes. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and then, uh, yeah, low volume means we're not turning out like we're not fixing a thousand crash cars a day or in a machine shop that are producing things. Like you mentioned that one example where the department of defense was called for an order of 1000 things. So in a calendar year, you have a thousand things. Yes. To, that yes. By definition, that's not, It's not over the top. That's like, you know, I could, in my brain, I was already starting to figure out what the tag time would have been for something in a 12 month period. (laughs) And I was like, (laughs) (laughs) like, I'm going to get a repeating decimal. I know, (laughs) but but, uh, so that's low volume. So on the flip side where we see like assembly, where we've got uh, tag times, you know, and we see, we see cars turning out in sub two minutes or one minute. And those types of assemblies. So the volume is very high, almost a continuous flow system where from the perception of the casual observer, when you observe assembly, it's like nothing ever stops. Things like come in, they're briefly paused for a second. Maybe they don't even stop. People move with the thing moving. If you're in a car line, they have these conveyor systems where the vehicle moves through the entire plant and the workers are stationary. In construction, it's just the opposite. The material is we bring, the workers bring the material to stationary locations and we put things in and then the workers move through as if uh, in the corollary in in assembly or manufacturing, in a high volume manufacturing, the things move through. So in construction, it's exactly the same, except the thing that moves is different. That's the only change, but all the other processes can 100% be adapted the same way. High volume, for example, you know, you look at extrusion lines, pipe manufacturing, uh, anything that has extrusion, you know, wire, coil, you know, what Goldrat, you know, Goldrat has a very good uh, classification. He calls it VATI. Basically, he says that, you know, you apply the theory of constraints, first understand what is the production system you're dealing with. So. A car is A, many components become one. Uh, Steel is V, because you begin with molten steel and that could become anything, coil, wire, rebar, whatever, right? Right. V, A, T. T is mass customization. Everything goes up, common line, and you customize it at the end. So like in in what I do, when you design manufacturing cells, everybody says, you shape cell, you shape cell. Yeah, they do. Yeah, it's like, forget about the other 25 alphabets. Hello, hello, there are 25 other alphabets. So if you go, and I don't know the exact groups, but there are about five clusters of alphabets. And each cluster represents a certain shape that's quite unique compared to the other four groups. The point again is that when you are in high mix, not every end item goes through the same sequence of steps. But you would like people to be in proximity with each other. So why can't you take like a line and make it like a clover leaf? Now, three people work two to three machines each. It's not a line. Goldrat kind of is a marketing guy. He, you know, he took something and then he packages it as, oh, this is my knowledge. But, you know, there's a much bigger, solid technical knowledge base in the industrial engine literature. I just wish there were more. Fusion, you know. Yeah, that's a, a great example. Of Gold Rat, mm-hmm. his work in theory of constraints was incredible. He wrote this uh, book, a uh, fictional book called The Goal, which I highly recommend anyone to read. 
and especially get it on Audible. We don't make any money by recommending books, by the way. We just like. Oh, you don't. Oh, why do you do that? No. I mean, your book will have. <laughs> we'll have your book in the show notes. I'll make sure we put a link so <laughs> somebody's going to get money when you get the uh, job shop lead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Goldratt, uh, his training as well was a physicist. He was trained as a physicist, as a scientist, and he found a huge problem in going to first principles. And he, you know, through his stories, says he's derived this methodology. So he's derived like a way to approach problems of dealing with flow. And literally that is like the basis. I think you're right. There is a component to marketing that is missing in industrial engineering. It's definitely missing in some of the sciences. The sciences, I think, do not do a good job of uh, providing information that industry can readily just pick off and use. And so individuals have come, have come across and had mm-hmm. some success in some niche. And then they they can make something that's packaged for uh, people that are practitioners or people that are engaged in business every day, and they can just take it and go with it. I've made the analogy when we engage with people working and we ask them to do something different. We have like multiple different options. Most people that are very enthusiastic about continuous improvement will ask people to make a change that is like asking them to jump across the Grand Canyon. And what we should be doing is going for incremental changes and say like, here's, here's a line I've drawn on the floor. Can you step over the line? Right. And stepping over the line is a small change to go. And a lot of people approach continuous improvement with such fever and passion and, and like zeal that it comes off like you, like you said, or maybe I said it, it comes off a little cultish and very like, like dogmatic where it's gotta be this way or it's not the thing. What does continuous improvement mean to you and why is it important? To me, it's just what I do. Industrial engineering is just, I mean, I look at these words, continuous improvement and, you know, all these different words. And it's like, it's what I do. I mean, it's it's somebody else having coined a word for it. But, you know, when people say uh, we are recruiting lean engineers and we are recruiting continuous improvement engineers and I go through the job description, it's like, this is industrial engineering. People will say you SOB, whatever, and worse, you know, to me. But it's like, yeah, that's it. I mean, continuous into all these words, OPEX, operational excellence, and world-class manufacturing. If only industrial engineers pulled their heads out of their butts and did their freaking jobs, we would not have a problem with all these buzzwords. It's because, I don't know, academia has not passed on anything new to industry. All these buzzwords have come up to fill the vacuum. Gold rat comes up with something, you know, Shigeo comes up with something. It's just not the full package. You know, lean is just a smattery. It's from the top. It's a bunch of non-industrial engineers who picked up something, rehashed it, reworded it, you know, muda, mura, muri, and all, you know. So I don't know. I mean, when people say, what do you do? I said, I do industrial engineering. Oh, do you do six sigma? Yeah, I do. I call it design of experiments. Yeah, I do data analysis. Do you do Six Sigma? No, I only have a black belt. It's holding up my big belly. You know that. You know, <laughs> that, you know and that's the that's sad part that industry is leaving the hiring of the talent, which will do good things for them to HR people who go pick up something online and say, oh, I need to put a Lean Six Sigma job description. There are these powerhouse industrial engineering programs, Wisconsin, Madison, you know, uh, Purdue, you know, I mean, solid Georgia Tech, right? right? Get out there, get out there and ask their faculty, hey, we need you to align with what we need. And I just, like I said, okay, so continuous improvement to me, I'm sorry, but uh, <laughs> it's a buzzword. I just think that uh, industrial engineers do it better. If not, demand it of them, hey, you go get a black belt or whatever. And you never see companies hiring for lean looking for industrial engineers, which now that you're talking about, it's so obvious that it's like, duh, it's like hit your head. Like, why aren't we just going and recruiting people with that type of experience? Because they're going to have lean Six Sigma operational excellence, like improving a process. Like these people have been trained for yeah. years yeah. how to improve processes to give you what the business wants. And business is not even looking Like, oh, there's this whole branch of engineering dedicated to improving processes to make our businesses better. (laughs) They're not even hiring there. So it's almost like industrial engineering is marketing by not marketing 
to not market itself <laughs> so that people don't know that they exist. No, I, I, you know, you, that that's the thing that, in fact, one of the posts I had was, has industry forgotten about industrial engineers? And that's to me is scary. Uh, like, you know, uh, I talk to Indian kids, you know, uh, they contact me and I'm like, I'm sorry, I can't give you a visa to come here. Fine. Okay. But I ask them, like the students that come to University of Houston, the ones I teach, rarely does any of them have a bachelor's in industrial engineering. So I ask them, why not? Professor, there's no job market. I was an imaginary engineer. I had to humble myself, get my feet locked, knocked out from under me go implement stuff, fail, succeed, then you realize, aha, this is industrial engineering. Industrial engineering is a contact sport. You cannot just teach it as mathematical equations and simulation models in school. They are good, but you have to implement your shit. And we don't push it. So naturally, when they graduate, they will go to data science and machine learning and all that stuff. And the real important stuff, industry, hands-on. And so that vacuum has been filled up by all these buzzword mongers who, I'm sorry, but... (laughs) (laughs) Let let me not say any further. (laughs) Uh, You're now (laughs) (laughs) self-censoring. Yeah, you can. Basically, your editorial staff will come back and say, Philippe, we have nothing to... Everything has got censored. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no show. <laughs> no, this, this is going to be a great show and, uh, so now i want to pick on your industrial engineering mind in the construction industry i've had this conversation with people in construction not wanting to rec- literally not wanting to recognize what we do on a project as a production system now i've had the i have the benefit of working for a company now that does no no qualms about it what we do on every project is a production system and they've named it accordingly so Love that. Uh, love the bolt production system. So shameless plug to the people that uh, support my endeavors and experiments, with people in the field every single day. But from your perspective as an industrial engineer, what do you define a production system to be? So this is, uh, I got this from the Britannica.com. Okay, so uh, take it with a pinch of salt, but keywords, a production system transforms a variety of resources into useful goods and services using a variety of processes. Resources, they are transformed using processes with a purpose. There's a commercial purpose. Anything. As production system sounds shockingly close to the Russ Acoff definition of just a general system. I mean, I very, inputs, outputs, right, resources, and you, constraints. And yeah. you added the, it has to have a purpose. I mean, that's one of the differentiators. And Deming has the same uh, definition for what a system is as well. Uh, him and Russ were contemporaries or uh, an architect or another engineer, even a mechanical engineer. Yeah, You're doing something for, you're transforming some information or materials. Again, this sounds like what I remember in lean thinking, Womack defining what value is. He mm-hmm. uh, sounds like he's defining value in terms of a production system. It's a beneficial transformation of materials, information, uh, with people and other resources into something useful that somebody or some entity, some customer, some stakeholder actually desires and wants. It produces, right? Even a kitchen, even a school kitchen which prepares meals is a production system. It produces. It produces something that, if it is not scrap, is consumable. It is paid for. It, it benefits somebody. You know, So a construction site, it is a production system. You yes. produce a beautiful building. There are two things, right? Flows of materials and flows of information. Duh, where have we heard that? Value stream mapping. You know? <laughs> I was going to say, that's exactly where it came from, yeah. Yeah, you know? So flows of materials, raw materials, work in process, finished goods, machines, people, flows of information, drawings, specifications, routers, production plans, capacity plans, delivery schedules. Uh, it, from an industrial entry point of view, material flow is facility layout, material handling, storage systems, shop floor control, information flow, production planning control, everything that your ERP system <laughs> fails to do. <laughs> do. <laughs> hey, you said it. You said it, not me. I'm glad. <laughs> so. Oh, ERP systems. Oh, you know what? When people talk about waste, you know, I'm like, look at the ERP system. 
Go, I mean, if you're talking, like people say, I'm going to do a Gemba walk. No, sit in your office and try to do some transactions with your ERP system. That's the Gemba walk people are not doing. The Gemba walk in IT space, the ERP space. Hello, there's a physical Gemba and there's an electronic Gemba. Your freaking ERP system has been screwing you for the last how many decades? Like SAP stops all production. <laughs> 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 I was taught this. I was taught this on my job. Okay, so we should we should uh, we should coin the phrase. I'm gonna have to add a section out to the description below <laughs> of uh, Dr. Arani's corrected acronyms. No, no, no. <laughs> no, but I'm just saying a production system. You know, a production system basically is, uh, you know, then so there's information flow, materials flow, information flows, and then the material flows are subject to resource capacity constraints disruption of information flows, complexity of production planning control, quality, and then adaptability to the environment, you know, like resilience and stuff like that, right? So a production system is basically, like you said, inputs, outputs, resources, constraints, uh, management guidelines, what they call the five M's, yep. uh, anything, anything. Oh, that five, I've heard of the four M's. Manpower, machinery, materials. Money. Fifth one is money. Oh, money. Money. money the fifth them. Okay, I forgot money. about See, we, this is things that we don't learn when we play telephone game with industrial engineering. <laughs> we, we get missed what the, the other parts are. We need more of that adventurism from industry that, look, this lean stuff is 1900 stuff. You know what? So, so basically, define your metrics, identify your value streams, achieve flow inside each value stream, do pull scheduling inside each value stream, then pursue continuous improvement in this value stream, go back, pick another value stream, repeat the process. It's along what Goldrad does. Goldrad also has Poogie, process of ongoing improvement. He has five steps, you know? Yep. So I just feel that when I saw those five principles, I saw three major problems, three hard industrial engineering problems. What's your product family? Oh, a value stream is a group of products that follow the same sequence of steps. Yeah, that's easier said than done. I'll give you a thousand products. Now you tell me which ones belong in one value stream. So when you ask people, how did you define your product family? It's like, you know, the deer in the headlights, you know, yeah. whatever. Hmm? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Second, uh, we should get flow inside each value stream. Aha. Have you designed the layout? Have you got the material handling system? Have you got the elect production control feeds to the shop floor? <clears throat> okay. Third, full scheduling, which means you should schedule subject to finite capacity constraints, especially if it's make to order. <clears throat> we rely on our ERP system. <clears throat> That's it, forget it. The moment people say we have an ERP system, I'm sure 10 people are meeting twice a week to correct the spreadsheet, which they call a schedule. Yeah? <laughs> I'm not joking. I know. I'm only laughing so hard because I've seen this exact thing happen uh, everywhere that the ERP, is this ERP system is forcing people to do stuff. You have teams of people doing workarounds to shore it up because it's not, it's making them overproduce almost always. And uh, it's so many different types of problems. And I'm sure we'll have the haters out there telling us that we've just never seen a proper ERP system implemented. And I'm like, show me the literature. We're <laughs> going to see one. I'm going to pull a, a Dr. Irani and be like, let me see the case study. <laughs> so anyway, uh, the, that's, that's the five principles of lead. And that's all I've done. I took the best of what group technology taught me. I took the best of what Toyota taught me, and I found a, found something unique in the process where I'm like, no, I'm not gonna follow a cookie cutter approach just because you said, oh, it's you know the Toyota production system. It doesn't work. Cookie cutter approaches will not work, you know. And if you read the Toyota Way published in 2001 by Toyota themselves, or if yes. you read Jeffrey Liker's book, The Toyota Way, which talks on the 14 principles and many of the same, it builds upon the same thing from yeah. Toyota's Ruby publication. Like Dr. Ronnie saying, there's so many things in any one of these domains that has like, it could be like 10 books worth 
of knowledge behind each one concept that's presented. You might see something presented in a chapter, but in reality, to go implement it in the real world, it's probably like, you know, five a five book series, you know, or or it's three years of actual hands on experience that go with that. Like a lot of these concepts, like when I read Lean Thinking, you know, in the first chapter where he's talking about just this concept of value and waste, to even just get that ingrained into your thinking, it didn't like you didn't read the the sentence and the definition, and then all of a sudden you can see non value steps everywhere. Yeah. You have to start yeah. training yourself to see it, and that. That takes time. It's, you know, it's a function of your intellect. It's a function of like, did you get no sleep last night? It's a function of, are you, you know, so many factors function into how quickly you're going to pick up those concepts. And I love it that you've got an academic background. So like they'll say, like, cause there's people listening to the show, you know, the show is easier, better for construction. And we stole that from Shingeo Shingo when he was teaching Taiichi Ono how to implement his system. Mm-hmm. That you have to make it easier first, then it becomes better. When it's better, it becomes faster. When it's faster, your cost will go down. It becomes yeah. cheaper. Yeah. That is the basis of the whole show. Easier, better, faster, cheaper. Yeah. So for people listening and hear these buzzwords, do you think that as lean is lectured, doesn't apply in real life or as these books have published should not apply? What, what is your feeling on this? To the, to the contrary, I think that lean is dumb. I mean, <laughs> I, I think lean is trivial. It's uh, fluff. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. Like I said, again, industrial engineering is the meat. And I accept that industrial engineers like me have to pull their heads out of their butts to kind of understand how lean is the first layer of industrial engineering. Okay, I get it. But once I get it, it's all industrial engine from there on because I have that thinking that I believe the Toyota industrial engineers, for example, do. So all this talk about you know leadership and culture change and Ubers, you know what? If people are running around making itty bitty changes at a certain point, it flames out. Yeah. There is hard stuff that exists in every business until you see those problems and admit that they exist. You are not going to improve. You are going to say lean flamed out. I mean, like when Toyota says, oh, we're doing continuous improvement. I feel that there's a bunch of mechanical engineers who are trying to do industrial engineering. No wonder they effed up. We understand the complexity of the problem. And then we know the level of solution quality to pursue. Again, to these people who might say, oh, lean is very academic. No, 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 no. Lean is good. But what you've been told lean will do for you is not anything <laughs> rocket sciences or, or, or significant. Lean doesn't go too far. It talks a lot. Show me the results. That's it. To tell the lean CEO, take Gemba walks and all that stuff. Yeah. But the guys on the floor, how good are they? If they just do this cookie cutter thing, yeah, we'll do value stream mapping and put up you know, lean daily management reports. Did they even understand the production system that you have? Oh, no, 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 no. We just did tag time, a hijunka, a one-piece flow. And anybody, you want to argue with me, please, you know, like we have a fair conversation here. I'm happy to discuss with it. It's good stuff, but you please be ready to go deeper. You know, I know that there's a lot of argument, you know, like lean construction. And like, like I said, I don't know about projects, but you put me into any company supplier that produces product for a construction site, boom, boom, boom. It's industrial engineering, and I will give you a production system appropriate to what they are doing. Don't give up on me. It is not academic. It is not academic. Because why? It's it's base level industrial engineering, and industrial engineering is as important as mechanical engineering or chemical engineering or electrical engineering. We jump in with lean, these gurus go in and HR consultant, whatever. It's people, culture change, change management, back off. You know, treat people with respect and say, what are your problems? And they'll tell you this freaking ERP system doesn't work. Or I have to go take printouts from that copier 50 feet away when actually I'm filling up the paperwork at my station here. You know, you've got to say, hey, where's the beef? And that beef is industrial engineering. But I think people like you who are in industry have to get up and say, hey, you industrial engineers, 
get with it. <laughs> Dr. Sharuk Arani, it's been my pleasure having you on the show. Thank you. Uh, you know, now that you've said all that, tell people where can they find you so they can engage in said dialogue. Uh, and we'll put links to everything in the show notes below. But uh, what's what's your preferred method of contact for people that have questions for you and want to continue the conversation? Yeah, go on LinkedIn, send me a message. Be as complimentary as you can be, or you can cuss me out. Doesn't matter, but LinkedIn <laughs> is good. <laughs> this has been uh, my pleasure having you on the show. I've learned so much, and I've got so many more things to go investigate and experiment with. I was honored uh, that you even thought about you know bringing me on the show so i think the honor is mine and uh, you know i'm always up for a good conversation uh, as long as you're willing to hear counter opinions and thank you very much felipe because i know i know the conversations where we got to know each other and i know it was about cpm and how the rest of the group was reacting and then suddenly you came up and said uh, why don't we have you on for my show and i'm like oh he gets it. Very special thanks to my guest. I'm Felipe Engineer Manriquez. The EBFC show is created by Felipe and produced by a passion to build easier and better. Thanks for listening. Stay safe, everybody. Let's go build. <laughs>